Decisions, decisions. Maybe you've said it, maybe you've heard it, but it's a phrase that we often hear in our modern world of everyday experience. It refers to a specific sort of decision that we face in life. Many times we use it ironically, um, humorously even, probably the majority of the time. Say you're at the ice cream shop and you stand there with all the flavors before you and you don't know which to choose. And as you stand there and someone's with you, you might say, decisions, decisions. Sometimes we use it more accurately, though, and more seriously. And we're facing a serious life decision. Something like, do I get an abortion or not? Do I get a divorce or not? Do I commit suicide or not? So this refers to decisions that exasperate us because they are not easy to make. In these decisions, we're not choosing between something very, very obviously bad and something very, very obviously good, but between what is called two evils, two hurts, two undesirable outcomes. In the world of logic, this is called a dilemma. The word dilemma in logic has two parts, the prefix meaning to, die, to, and to lemma is to, to lay down. So two things. I got enough water today. Two things in front of you that you must choose between, but the word etymology itself doesn't bring out. It, it is two different courses of action that are hurtful to you. That's what makes something a dilemma. We have many descriptions beyond the definition. We've got many descriptions of this. We talk about being on the horns of a dilemma, and thus we mean the painfulness of it. You go this way, you get poked. You go that way, you get poked as well. We, we may say here in the South, I'm in a bind, or we may say I'm in a vice, in the vice grip. We may say, you may hear someone say they're caught in the middle, trapped, no way out between a rock and a hard place. You see the point. Or you may hear someone say, pick your poison. Right? Or as I like to call it, I'm in a quagmire. <laughs> That's the word I've used that Justin has remembered. The point is, no matter which you pick, someone gets hurt. That's a dilemma. Uh, I just quoted, by the way, uh, a story, a popular one, The Notebook. And the reason for that is it's what makes a story intense. It's what makes an audience sit on the edge of their seat. Which decision will they choose? And so she says at the climax of that movie, no matter what I do, somebody gets hurt. It's a dilemma. And so there... These in the biblical stories as well. Eve originally faced a dilemma. If she didn't sin, she felt hurt. She would never know what the so-called freedom was like. So she had to choose between these two. And she did. There are others in Scripture, a famous dilemma that I think of. Pilate faced a dilemma either crucify the Son of God or become an enemy of Caesar. There wasn't two easy choices. It was hurt or be hurt. Which hurt do you want? And it squeezed out the decision. Our Lord Himself faced a dilemma. Right? Not my will but yours be done. He faced a dilemma. God Himself faced a dilemma. He cannot just forgive the wicked. 
So if he, if he doesn't forgive the wicked, then his love is not expressed. But, it, but if he does forgive the wicked, there must be a sacrifice. And the cross is the answer to what Paul Washer has called the divine dilemma. So the point again is that something is always getting hurt. And that's why people delve into the world of quotes for answers, for helps, to somehow I'll find some guidance to help them uh, for some direction in these things. And, and none are more popular and more interesting than presidential quotes. Because we know that presidents, like all leaders, don't just find themselves in the bind in the predicament, in the quagmire of choosing between what's hurtful for them and hurtful for others, but often what's hurtful for others and hurtful for others. Do we want 300 people killed or 3,000 people killed? And we need to know in a minute what your choice is. That is a dilemma of the utmost sort. And so... One, of the, one such famous quote comes from number 26, 26th president of the U.S., Teddy Roosevelt, which says this, quote, In any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing, and the worst thing you can do is nothing. Well, I don't know how much truth is in there, but I know the first part is uh, sort of not an answer because that's the very problem, isn't it? We don't know what the right thing is in a dilemma. It doesn't quite feel right to hurt anybody. And thus, the search. What is right? We know the right thing to do is the right thing to do. What is the right thing to do? So how thankful I was to be able, in God's providence, to study Paul's famous dilemma. How thankful we can be that God has put this in the Bible. This is the famous dilemma the Apostle Paul faced. And after you watch him with me face it, there can be no doubt whatsoever what the right thing is to do for the child of God in any dilemma you and I will ever face. So let's look at it this morning, beginning with point number one in verse 22, where we see Paul's dilemma detected. Paul's dilemma is detected. Point number one, verse 22. If he stays, he says it will help them. Verse 22, but if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. So don't let the for me mess it up there. Uh, it's not really for him. It's ultimately for them as verses 24 to 26 make plain. It's more necessary for their sake. Or verse 25 says it's for their progress, their progress. Joy in the faith, verse 26, their confidence and boasting in Christ through him. So if he stays, it will help him, and therefore it naturally follows. If he leaves, it will hurt them, right? If he leaves, it'll hurt them. Well, it seems easy. All things being equal, that's all that's on the table. Well, then stay, Paul, right? If I stay, it'll help them. If I leave, it'll hurt them. What's the big deal? How are you in a dilemma? I mean, he just told us that either way was okay. That's what we saw last week. Either way is okay. Stay, go, fine with me. But now it seems either way is not okay. It seems that he has a choice. And so we go to point number two. Verses 23 to 24, where Paul's dilemma is detailed. So point number one, Paul's dilemma is detected. Verse 22, that's why I mean just detected. It, it's not really explained. You just see that he's in a dilemma because he says, 
He does not know which to choose. So there must be another one. So we go to point two in verses 23 and 24, and here's where Paul's dilemma gets detailed out. And here he lays out the full details of everything that he's dealing with internally. He says there's more at stake here than just if he leaves, it hurts them. There's this other thing. There's something else pressing on him. He says, verse 23, but I am hard pressed from both directions. And, and, and this is a word that means to hold together, to, to press in such a way that normally I need my hand under this bottle to keep it from falling, but you can press something so tight that it's stuck between the two. Paul literally describes his soul as smashed together in the sense that there is something pushing him from this side that would have him go this direction in his life, but something pushing him from this side equally in pressure that would have him go this way in his life. And so he's just crammed in between pressure on both sides. He's like a running back being shoved by the offensive line this way, the defensive line this way. There are these two forces, but they're internally, so they're, they're painting Paul. So it's not comfortable in terms of the horns of dilemma analogy. Either way he turns, he gets poked. If he leaves, it hurts him in his heart because he knows it's going to hurt them. If he stays, it hurts him in his heart for the reason he's about to tell us. He gives us the other side of the dilemma now. Verse 23, the participle having is explaining, that verb having the desire is explaining the other thing that's pressing on him. So let's, let's look at it. He says, there's more than just leaving will hurt them. Staying will hurt him. Because if he gets to leave, he gets to depart and be with Christ, which he calls much more better. And that's literally how it's said. Paul's talking like a little child here. Much more better. Three superlatives. So what he says, so I must tell you how wonderful this was for me uh, this week because I don't think there's any other affection that I have in my heart that keeps me near the gospel than the fear of death. I think the fear of death is healthy. I think you're insane if you don't fear death. I think you're asleep in life if you're not fearing death. And, and drowsy and drunk with the world if you're not thinking about your death. The reality of death should almost drive you mad, the fact that you're going to die. Um, I, I, have, I have, this thing causes me to cling to Christ more than anything. It doesn't matter how much I love you. It doesn't matter how much you love me. We're not dying together. And like Jonathan Edwards said on his deathbed, he told his daughter, he said, my children are soon to be left fatherless. May this be an inducement to cause you to seek a father that will never fail you. So you see, you say, well, this relationship's bad. It doesn't matter if it's good. They can sit by your hospital bed all they want. I know I am one day going to die, and Mr. Ford can't help me. Miss Rhonda can't help me. Tony can't help me. I am going to die alone and be confronted with the Almighty. So I need to know about this. Like John Wesley said, I said last week, the reason this place is known as the Wesley Center, it could have been called the Whitfield Center. But Whitfield said, let my name die. Thus we see the Wesley Center when we come in. 
But John Wesley was a good man in many ways, and he said, he's, he's got this big quote where he says, I'm a spirit from God, soon to return to God. Uh, he says, give me the book of God. He says, at any price, give me that book. I need to know the way to heaven. And so I, if, if you know anything about that, if you're not drunk, if you're not asleep, if you do fear death, see the sweetness of this word with me that I got to see this week. <clears throat> this word, depart. Where he says that I may depart and be with Christ. L literally think about this. I, I don't have to find an analogy here. Paul gives it to us all. Depart literally says to loosen up. Okay? Culturally, though, in Paul's day, this was used of a ship loosening up its rope from its moorings, a.k.a. its anchor, its, its dock, the thing it's hooked to, in order to set sail to some other destination. Paul is literally picturing his life. He feels... Uh, the rope of his life already loosening from this world. And, and he pictures death as his soul loosening the rope literally from his physical body, from the whole physical world to set sail to another country. That's the imagery. I mean, I thought in light of this, it, it's, it's biblical to say when someone we say we usually say someone when a Christian dies, they didn't pass. It's not that they passed away; they sailed away. Be the be the biblical way to describe it. He sailed away. That's the imagery, and to sail away to this place that he describes as much more better than this one. I liked that. I liked that. Uh, I, I emphasize them on purpose because Paul was not a Greek, okay? There are things in this life that can disappoint, and Paul knew all about that. He had been mistreated. It's like C.S. Lewis said, has this world been so kind to you when he wrote a letter to a lady that you regret leaving it? <laughs> well, that's good so far as it goes, but Paul doesn't just say, I want to depart, does he? I want to depart not to some unconscious, bodiless existence just to get away from the vicissitudes and throes and woes of life. That's in there. That he wants to depart. That was the Greek idea of his day of the immortality of the soul. Just get out of this horrible world. No, Paul wants to depart into a conscious existence. But it's a different one. To part and be with Christ. That's a little bit different. It's a lot different. Paul longed for a bodily existence with Christ. We know that from 2 Corinthians 5. If you want to turn there with me. The other parallel passage to this. What is known as the intermediate State in 2 Corinthians 5, it's kind of interesting to put these two together because here in Philippians, what he calls very much better, in 2 Corinthians 5, he says he doesn't want. So we need to put these things together. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, he says, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So that's talking about his resurrection body. If this body is torn down, there's going to be a resurrection body. Verse 2, For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Now I want you to see there, Paul's not longing for the disembodied state but for the bodily existence of the resurrection. This is something we need to be telling children, that, that the goal 
uh, of the Christian faith sometimes gets warped into, I, I hear people say it, I'm like, what are you talking about? This brother's body is rotting in the grave and you're quoting death, where is your victory? Well, in one sense, I get it, but that's not what 1 Corinthians 15 is about. When Paul says, death, where is your victory? He says, God, God, the victory God got, He's not losing any part of you. He's redeeming all of it. And so, death, where is your sting? And grave, where is your victory? means grave. The grave will give up the dead. And He'll raise you bodily. And so, the goal of the Christian life is not a bodily, bodiless existence, an incorporeal soul existence. It's not how God made us. He made us with an immaterial part. He made us with a material part. So don't freak kids out with saying, you know, you need to believe in Jesus or, you know, so that you can have this, uh, you know, float around like a spirit. Not that they don't know anything about. All they know is the world and flowers and animals and grass. And No, you tell them there will be a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. So anyway, verse 3 though, he says, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. So I read that to say, Paul is longing for both. Somehow we got to put this together. In between now and then, what... 2 Corinthians 5 is talking about is what theologians call the intermediate state. What happens when a believer dies before the second coming of Christ? It's an intermediate state with Christ, but it's not the very best state with Christ. Still very much better than what we experience now, according to Paul. It's like sailing from, it's like you got three lands, you're sailing from this one to this one, which is better than this one, but it's still not that one, is the idea. Um, I thought of C.S. Lewis's, one of his books, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which I made a movie off of this one. The little mouse, Reepicheep, gets to get in a little boat and sail to Aslan's country. In, in this movie, and he goes over the, and it's just amazing that that's the imagery Paul has when a believer dies. <laughs> and I love it. He, he tells Aslan, he says, you know, something like, uh, I've, I've been many places in, in my life here in this world, but none of that has dampened my desire for your country. And he says, I know I'm hardly worthy but if you would give the word, I would gladly lay down my sword to see your country with my own eyes. And so he's allowed to go. He says, my country was made for, for noble hearts like yours. So there's no such thing as soul sleep. When the Bible describes a person as being asleep, it's just describing what the physical body looks like. There is no unconscious state after death. The believer moves right into his union with Christ transcends death. Nothing can separate him from the love of Christ. He is now one spirit with the Lord. And Jesus says in the Gospel of John, he that believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. The Lord Jesus Christ says God is not the God who was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says he is the God of the living. They're alive. 
for the unbeliever, they don't go into unconscious existence either, but they are immediately separated from God and from Christ, and this life is very much better than where they go after death. That they don't move into unconsciousness, they remain conscious, and they remain conscious forever that they're lost. These are the two options. These are the two things that happen. And, and so, Paul, they're so quick, Paul could literally use the slogan, if we were to keep reading in 2 Corinthians 5, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord instantly. It's a short boating trip. Instant. Instantly with the Lord. And so, I thought, you know, we can think of the three states to try to help believers, try to help myself think of it. I thought of these three, the believer, put all this together into a theology. The believer experiences, this is a biblical theology of death for a believer, or the three states of intimacy with Christ. The first state is the present one. Uh, where we know him through the word, through the spirit, through prayer, through these things. The second state is the intermediate state, and the third state is the final resurrected state. And you could compare it to this. If you take the modern iPhone, you can have a, a kind of intimacy with <clears throat> someone where you're texting or calling them then you can raise the intimacy level with maybe a FaceTime, but then you can really raise the intimacy level when you're there in front of each other in the flesh. And so the Christian knows Christ now through the Word, but then there's a heightened experience at death where you feel the smile of His face and of His glory and of His love in a way that you never even imagined now that Paul could call it very much. This man whose heart was swollen with the love of Christ says that's very much better. But then there's even something greater than that, walking around in the flesh in the new heaven, in the new earth on the last day. Now you can see why he smashed together, right? He's, he's got, surely he's being pushed to that. For all that Paul did, he's going to tell us in chapter 3, his heart throbbed. I said it again and say it again, that Paul could have sung that song, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. In Psalm 63, 3, he could have wrote that, the loving kindness of the Lord is better than life. He tells us in chapter 3, his great passion is not to know uh, theology, but to know him. To know the person, to know the soul of Christ. To be face to face with Christ, gaze to gaze, soul to soul, heart to heart. That was Paul's dream. That was Paul's desire. That was the intimacy he was after. Clearly, if he stays, it will hurt him. Clearly, Paul, of all people, could have said, haven't I gone through enough? How many times do we hear, well, you don't understand. Well, I can promise you this, Paul does. If you want to go toe-to-toe, we'll read 2 Corinthians further. He says, look, are, are they, have they been suffering? I far more. So whatever you have, this is not a, a graduate student from a seminary who's never held a job, who's never been married, who's never fooled with children, who's, who's never interacted with the world teaching us about life. This is a man crippled, beaten, stoned, many troubles, this and that, all the other. He's got all the t-shirts. And he's saying to us, that would be far more better for me. I could depart. I could be with Christ. It would be far more better 
He could have fell into that. He could have, he could have, he could have fell into self pity and said, "Haven't I done enough? Haven't I done enough? Is it just let me go? Go ahead and swing low, sweet chariot." Tired of living? I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was. Yet equally clearly this apostle, because he loves such a one as Christ, is hurt to leave these behind. It hurts him. They'll miss out on teaching like this. Think how different my soul is blessed just from reading this teaching on the intermediate state. We would not have it. I wouldn't have this imagery of sailing away. I wouldn't have it. And, and, and so it will hurt them. Uh, he cannot do both. He can only do one. If he leaves, hurts them. Stays, hurts him. He must either leave or stay. Conclusion somebody's getting hurt. Who will it be, Paul? Is it going to hurt them? Or is the decision going to hurt him? So we go to the final point, point three. Verses 25, 26, where we see Paul's dilemma is determined. So Paul's dilemma was first detected. Then Paul's dilemma was detailed. And now Paul's dilemma is determined with all of this information in front of him. And, and, and I thought as I read this, many times we should probably, we don't ever do this, actually write out the details of what you're trying to figure out. Just write it out. Put it on paper. We like, we like to think of our decisions as a lot better than they are. But when you write them out, you're like, you know, it's kind of one of them where you're like, do you hear what you're saying that you're wanting to do? So with all the details in front of him, and providence forcing and squeezing a decision out of him, he says, verse 25, convinced of all of this, notice, I know. So he began in verse 22 with, I don't know. Now he says, I know. So now there's resolution. I will, he says, remain and continue with you all. And look why. Look at the sweet heart that this sour decision reveals. For your progress and joy in the faith. <clears throat> That's objective. Not subjective. He's not talking about like your subjective faith. But your advancement in the faith delivered down to the saints one for all, the body of Christian teaching, doctrine, theology, what we mean about the Bible, what we mean about God, what we mean about Christ, what we mean about man, what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit, what it teaches about eschatology, what it teaches about angels, what it teaches about the world, what it teaches about various sins, what it teaches about your own heart. He means all of this theology. If I stay, you will make progress in these things. They will come into your mind. They will get down seeping into your heart. And they will come out through the will in your life. But that's the immediate motive. Notice the ultimate motivation. though, Verse 26, so that you're... This is a bad translation just because of cultural difference here. Proud. Uh, it's just boasting. It's just the word for glorying, for boasting, for making much of. So that your, your boasting may abound, may overflow in Christ Jesus in me is, is the order. It's kind of wooden, but it's important. Paul, Paul is putting Christ first. So the ground, the object that they're boasting in is Christ and the means to that end is Paul. 
Paul is just thrilled to be a means, be a means to an end. And we like to say, well, you just treat me like an object. You just treat me like a means or whatever. Paul thought, Lord, would you? Would you? Could I, could I just be an object? Happy. Happy to be a means to an end. Happy to, happy. He, he's acting the part of the bride of Christ here. I don't even want a name. I, I take on the Lord's name and just furthering His purposes in the world. There's something more for my Lord to do, and that's how he began, right? Isn't it anyway, Lord? What what would you have me to do? That's enough to give a Christian joy, isn't it? I remember I had Jason Myers, other than God just having a sense of humor, to, to let me meet him before he went to go pastor and fill in and take John Piper's place for New Testament, and we had to, he, he made us write journal entries on, on each letter, so you had to read a chapter, write a journal entry, and, and for the one on Hebrews, when he, he graded them, gave them back, the one for Hebrews, I still have it, he wrote out into the margin in the red pen, I gloried in Christ while reading this, thank you. Now, that's quite a thing. Quite a memory for me to have, like Jason Myers was profited <laughs> from me. D- d- I mean, wouldn't it make you happy to be used? Something, something you wrote, something you said, swole out another believer's chest a little bit more and gave more f- fanned in the flame their love for Christ, spread the knowledge of Christ throughout the world more. It's important we end on that note because the Apostle Paul, though he is sacrificing, he's still rejoicing. So let's just get that out there. What we're not talking about is God doesn't need any helpers. Okay? We're not talking about the kind of sacrifice where God, where we become the product, the, the, the older brother and say, I've done all this stuff for all these years, like that's not the kind of sacrifice we're talking about. Paul tells us God's not served by human hands as though he needed anything. If he needed any cattle or whatever, he says, I would not ask you if I was hungry. I wouldn't ask you. And Mordecai tells Esther, look, if you don't do it, someone else will do it. You're not needed but He has chosen to include you out of free, condescending kindness. So out of the goodness of His heart, He allowed you to participate. It's like, like someone has used, if, it's like if I'm moving this right here somewhere and one of the other kids is going to put their t- hand on it, and I just let them think they're helping me. But, I mean, Paul says, what is Paul? What is Apollos? We were doing this and this, but God was causing the growth. We're not doing anything. We're just given the privilege to put our hand on the podium while he moves it. So Paul is is not serving in that way. Paul really is rejoicing in this. Paul, like his Lord, really is enjoying foregoing for about five more years. This is about AD 60. About eighty sixty five in his second Roman imprisonment, he will say, "The time of my departure has come." He foregoed it for about another five or six years, and then he did sell away. And then his faith did become sight. But to stay behind for these little ones and their progress and joy in the faith, that was joy for Paul. And to know that people are going to glory in Christ more through it and be a means to an end, that was joy to Paul. So we have rightly labeled this section that we now are ending today as the caged bird is singing. Verses 12 to 26 of chapter 1, Paul's report from prison, the caged bird is singing. It's one of rejoicing.
even though there's much sacrificing. Everything he's given us to, that's a report. He's given us two reasons. <clears throat> On each side of the middle of verse 18, I rejoice, so I'm presently rejoicing. I'm, I'm rejoicing in the present advancement of the gospel. Yes, and I will rejoice. I'm rejoicing in the future advancement of the gospel. Those are the two reasons. The surprising present example, it turned out for the progress in the sacrificial future advancement of the gospel, which is why he ends with bookends or brackets in the section masterfully and artfully, what they call an inclusio. He's used the same word for progress. It's pro cape to cut forward, like you're going to your working on your deer stand and you cut through a thicket with a machete. That's the word for advancement or progress, he used it in verse 12. My circumstances, my imprisonment, has turned out rather for the progress, the advancement of the gospel. And now he says, I will stay for your progress and advancement of the gospel, thus bracketing the whole section. But how should we end if that's the way the section ends, how should we end today's sermon? Well, I thought I would tell you a story I came across this week. I've been slowly reading through this little book by Tim Challies I picked up at a conference recently on great men and their godly moms. Very little small book. And um, I learned that there was a man by the name of uh, William Borden who lived from 1887 to 1925. And I I think I would probably title this whole thing that Challies was trying to communicate as the real surrender in the life of William Borden. In other words, there was a surrender that looked like that was the surrender in his life, but there was really another one. And to tell you about it, he... uh, <clears throat> there, there's one reason I love it is so ordinary, uh, and it looks so unsuccessful. I, I kind of was wondering, like, why did he put it in here? <laughs> At first, there's so many towering other examples in here, and then there's just William Borden. Who knows who that is? And uh, the story of his mom. And you, you read of nothing about conversions and miraculous anything. It's just such... It, some people all, almost... Think of it as a tragedy. But William Borden was converted when he was seven. His his mom at 33, and she had four children, and he was the third, converted at seven. He immediately excelled in Christianity and all things and went to Moody Bible Institute. They were here in America, by the way, and uh, eventually uh, joined up, studied under J. Gresham Mason, and eventually was to go to China as a missionary. Dream kid, right? Um, I mean, one time she she asked her children what they wanted to be when they grow up, and he wrote, an honest man. (laughs) I thought, wow, who says that? But um, the real surrender comes from his mom, Mary Borden, because um, they had a special relationship. And when he was in his studies under J. Gresham Mason, his father died. And his mother is now alone. And so Challies writes that his, his ordination service was both a moment of great joy to Mary, but also sorrow. Because she knew she was about to never see him again. And she's a widow now. So they both face this dilemma, both he and her. And so he had made his decision to go, and how would she respond? Well, she supported him. The final Sunday in America was spent with her in her uh, Bible class or prayer group with them, and Challies writes that no sooner had William left 
that she wrote him of the comfort she had received that day. She quoted Luke 2.10, good tidings of great joy which shall be to all the people. And told how that verse had taken on new depth of meaning as she sat beside her missionary son that day. And then she wrote this to him in this same letter. I will never cease to be grateful for the rich blessing you have been to me, dear, a comfort and a strength all your years to your devoted mother. What a rich new year is unfolding before you, exclamation mark. She's being left behind. What a rich new year is unfolding before you. It was so beautiful having you with us in our little prayer circle. Just one more of the loving touches God has put to these last days. Never would she see him again. He was 25 years old. He went to Egypt first to learn the Arabic language. And he got cerebral meningitis. And she was on a trip to go visit. And she got there four hours too late, not even knowing he had been sick. He had already died at 25. You can almost hear John Piper asking the question is that a tragedy? Didn't read anything of any converts. Well, Mary Borden knew what Paul the Apostle knew. What Paul, as we come back next time, is going to turn and work into the lives of the Philippians, what he wanted his dear Philippians to know. And surely what God wants us dear people to know, that in any moment of decision, it's true, the best thing you can do is the right thing. I think a Christian could agree with that. But I think having heard this text, we need to add, and the right thing is the sacrificial thing. The right thing is a sacrificial thing. Having seen Paul face his dilemma, having seen the decision he makes in this dilemma, I say there can be no doubt about it that, that our decisions are either sacrificial or they're sinful. We're either living sacrificial lives or we're living selfish lives. There's no other. There's, no, there's two columns in this Excel spreadsheet and Paul will not add a third column. So whatever you have over here, if, it, if it's not sacrificial, you might as well drag it and paste it over here. This is where it goes. And, and, and we need to talk about this language today. About when we say things, we need to know where to drag and paste these things. How about the statement, well, I'm just not happy. What, what does that got to do with sacrifice? What column does that go in? Right over here. Paul says this would have been very much more happy for him. Well, this just isn't what I want to do. Well, are you a slave of Christ or not? What do you mean it's not what you want to do? Was the cross what Jesus wanted to do? And like Vodi Bauckham has said, you know, God wants you to be happy. So he says, let me get this straight. He wrote a story for his own son such that he was called the man of sorrows, but he wouldn't want you to be unhappy. I think if we were to read and if we were to pick up a book in, in, in Books a Million or anywhere and it says Nicholas Sparks as the author, we would say, I know what kind of story that's going to be. Some kind of romance story. 
Paul has learned the kind of stories God writes. If you're a Christian, if I'm a Christian, you can believe there will be dilemmas so that there can be sacrifices, so that there can be real Christ-likeness, because God is providentially orchestrating your life so that you will have to sacrifice. And thus, just like the forerunner, namely our captain who's gone before us, we too will be perfected through suffering. Maybe we need to ask ourselves some questions with a text like this. Do I need to make some changes? Having looked at Paul's dilemma and how he faced it here. Do I need to make some changes in my life? Am I facing some dilemma in a certain way that have not realized till now I've been facing this thing selfishly and not sacrificially? I, I, I've been, let's just call it out, I've been facing this thing sinfully, not sacrificially. You see, the ultimate question of our lives is not, will I get an abortion or not? Is will I be selfish or not? That's what's really being asked when you ask, will I, will I get an abortion or not? Well, there's this other question, will I get a divorce or not? Again, the question that's being asked is, will I be selfish or not? Oh, you could go on, will I commit suicide or not? Well, what's being asked there is, will I be sacrificial or will I be sinful? Because believe me, if you commit suicide, you didn't eliminate pain. You just shattered it to everybody else you left behind. But we could go on, couldn't we? Will I discipline my children or not? Makes life a little bit harder. Will I come to church or not? Well, I want to do this. Well, are you a slave of Christ or not? Right? Have you realized, have I realized, this is where we've been brought by this text to this point, that when you boil it all down, the ultimate question over my life and the ultimate question over your life is will I make a sacrificial decision or will it be a sinful decision? And in those decisions, what revelations are being made about my heart? Do I ultimately have a sacrificial heart or do I ultimately have an evil unbelieving, sinful heart that falls away from the living God. Decisions. Decisions. Let's pray.